Science is all about observation and prediction, and mathematics is an important tool that scientists use. This film explains how maths can help people to lead healthier lives. I'm a um, research as associate or research scientist at the Institute of Food Research. I'm currently working in natural products program and our remit is looking at um, food and how it benefits the body. Um, we know that certain foods are good for us but we're looking at why th these particular food items are good for us. Um, for example broccoli, what is it in broccoli that's supposed to give its health giving benefits so that's the sort of research that we're into and my involvement in that sort of thing is to work on nutritional trials where we get members of the public to come in and we will um, feed them the said food that we're looking at and we'll take blood samples and we'll analyze the blood and we'll sort of make deductions from their blood samples as to what it is in broccoli or strawberries or apples that's supposed to be good for us we are what we eat in a lot of respects and, and I think what we're hoping to do is improve people's lives. It's all about providing society with information so they can make informed choices. For example, there's been work done on oily fish and there's evidence to suggest that N3 fatty acids found in oily fish have implications for reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. And so if we can sort of provide results that will give members of the public that information, then we're, we're basically trying to get to the consumer before they get to the doctor in a way, sort of preventative. With humans, we're all so different, you see. And so in order to kind of get a standardised result, when you're planning a study, you do try to, you know, take all these confounding factors into account but then there comes a point in time where you have to say are we going to have men and women you know is there a difference between having men and women um, are we going to have smokers and non-smokers are we going to have people who are quite thin or people who are quite large so you you do think about the construction of the study you think about the group of people you're wanting to recruit very very carefully so that you get the best results you possibly can to give you the truest result that you possibly can because there are so many factors out there that are beyond our control you can see where sometimes nutritionists or people working in nutritional field may disagree because they've not taken into account the same factors and also populations for example um, you know the the ethnic mix you get in Norfolk would be completely different to the ethnic mix you would get in Leicester or London and does ethnicity and race have anything to do with some of the ways that we absorb these minerals you know there are so many things that you do have to take into account so you know, we just do the best we can with the information that we have at our hands, you know, and we just make sure that you write everything down so that people looking at our results will see the limitations or see what we've included. But Charlotte also has more mundane problems to contend with. The cost of running a human study, that's quite important. Costs of taking blood samples, um, costs of whatever it is we want to feed the volunteer. So, for example, if I'm working on a broccoli study, you know, how are we going to get the broccoli? How much is it going to cost? Where are we going to store it? The costs of storing things, the staff time, the cost of doing the analysis. And also, are we able to interpret the data sufficiently? You know, do we have the, the computer programs? Do we have the equipment, that sort of thing, in order to make sense of the data that we have? Um, so a lot of the maths that I use is really quite basic, it's nothing super duper until we get to the data then you start doing all the statistical analysis, the paired t-tests and that sort of thing to, to, make, to make sense of the results that you have. We have to present the data in a way that's kind of meaningful and so sometimes that might mean representing the data in the form of a table so it's easy to read or it might be representing it in a pie chart or in a bar chart you know so it, it really depends on what it is you're trying to to show what it is you're trying to explain through the data as to how it's represented and just to have a general feel for you know what the best thing to do what I enjoy most about my job is the variety of it because I'm never doing one thing 
for any length of time. When I'm sort of in the zone with volunteers working on the study in the morning, it could mean meeting the volunteer at the unit, um, taking blood samples, going through a questionnaire with them, um, just generally making them feel at ease. The volunteer is only here in the morning, so when the volunteer goes, I then have to process the paperwork, making sure that um, all all the rules associated with having members of the public on site are adhered to. And then there's maybe a little bit of analysis um, of the blood sample that we've taken, maybe spinning the bloods down, aliquoting them, storing them for further analysis. Um, when the volunteer aspect of the study is over, we then have the samples to analyse. And so my day would probably be working in the lab, analysing the samples, doing whatever assays, whatever tests that need to be done in order to get the results. When that portion of the project is over, it then comes to writing the report. So, for example, whoever is responsible for our funding, be it the um, BBSRC or the Food Standards Agency, we're accountable to them, so we have to write a report. And so I will spend a lot of time collating the data, um, talking to my colleagues who've worked on different aspects of the analysis, and writing a report, which will then be submitted. And then the cycle starts all over again. So I work on another project, and so it's sort of um, quite a cycle. I work in sort of like a cycle, really. At A-level, I did biology, chemistry and maths. Um, I absolutely adored chemistry. That was my thing. Absolutely adored chemistry. Organic chemistry was my particular favourite. Um, quite enjoyed maths. Although I did find applied maths a little tricky because that was a bit too physics-y and I was quite happy to leave physics, you know, behind at um, O-level. Um, I then decided to do medicinal chemistry at, um, at university, went to University of Sussex and to my horror I was expecting to go in there the first year of university and do organic chemistry, kind of the chemistry of drugs and that sort of thing, medicines, pharmaceuticals, but my first year was maths and chemistry and biology and it was a maths that I, I, it was all kind of applied maths, the stuff that I didn't really like doing, but eventually in the final year we got to doing the stuff that I really liked. And then, as a student, I noticed that there was an advert for volunteers for a study. And I thought, oh, that would be quite interesting. So I applied to be a volunteer on the study while writing up my PhD. And it turned out that they needed members of staff to work on the study. So I applied for that job and got the job. And so that's how my career working in nutrition, working on nutritional studies, how that, that's all started. It started from me volunteering for a study and then running the study and not looked back since really. Unfortunately scientists do have a bit of a, um, a weird reputation, a strange reputation for being a bit wacky, a bit zany or looking like Albert Einstein, but I'm a scientist and I don't like Albert Einstein. We're just normal people really. And we talk about the same sorts of things that everybody else talks about at our coffee breaks. It's just what we do for a day job is, you know, not a lot of people have access to. And so there's kind of a mystique attached to what scientists do in the lab. Um, we don't all wear lab coats. Some of us do. It's for our own protection. Um, yeah, it's, we do get a bit of a, um, a bad sort of reputation, but we're just ordinary people.